Good afternoon. I'm going to uh, call to order our continued budget hearing this Thursday, June 15th at 1.30 p.m. Uh, Colin, would you please do a roll call to establish the presence of a quorum? All righty. Supervisor Arenas is present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Present. Supervisor Smidian. Here. Present. Vice President Lee. Good afternoon, present. Present. And President Ellenberg. I'm here as well. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Absolutely. Please stand if you're able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we move to public comment, I want to uh, just take this opportunity to recognize today as Dr. Smith's uh, last budget, hopefully, last budget hearing <laughs> as our, our CEO and, and note that um, it's been, it, you've had largely an exciting opportunity to see a generally increasing budget. I know not every single year, but I, I just think that it's important to take a moment to recognize and thank you for your leadership on this monumental task for more than a dozen years. And thank I, you. I also, hang on before you go, uh, note that your birthday was yesterday. Yes. Uh, that's obviously why we didn't have a budget hearing yesterday, but want to <laughs> wish you a happy birthday. We have a good, little goodie for you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That's so nice of you. But I'm not going to sing. Um. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, 69 years. Hard to believe. But it's harder to believe my son is 50, 46. Makes me feel very old. <laughs> but thank you very much. You are... Are, are very welcome. Um, yes, I think we'll have much more to say at your actual last, uh, actual last meeting. Um, but this feels this feels very very significant today. Uh, colleagues, I, I do expect, as I said, that today will be uh, the last day of our budget hearings. Uh, I want to thank county staff and my own team for shepherding me through this uh, process as a board president for the first time and to the many, many county employees across the organization that have prepared this budget, made really tough decisions and responded to so many requests for additional information from myself and my colleagues over the past couple of months. Uh, and colleagues at the, at the May budget workshops and several times throughout the hearing process, I have referenced an anticipated agenda item for discussion regarding improvements to the budget process for fiscal year 2024-2025. I expected that item to appear as the final item on today's agenda, uh, but discovered this morning that the item did not make it onto today's agenda, so I want to apologize to my, my colleagues as I've held several of you off when you began to offer excellent input regarding improvements to the budget process, anticipating that we would have that conversation today. So as a, a remedy, uh, this item will be agendized for the June 27th board meeting, uh, at which time I'll attach a, a memo to the ledge file detailing my recommendations and will welcome your own observations and recommendations for improvements, either through submission of your own memos or in discussion on the dais. And, and again, with, with my apologies for the delay on that topic. Um, with that, we will move to public comment. This is the portion of the agenda set aside for members of the public wishing to address the Board of Supervisors on an item not, not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the board. Colin, do we have speakers either in chambers or on Zoom or both? Yes, we have both. We have 14 cards in person currently, and we have five online at the moment. All right, since we are currently over 15, our practice is to offer one minute of public comment. And for those of you who are, are newer in here, let me just note um, 
for, for everyone's edification how I'm running public comment. We hear speakers in the chamber first, followed by speakers in Zoom. We are happy to have as many speakers who would like to submit yellow cards to join us and participate in this process. But once the first speaker begins speaking, the queue is closed. That's for management purposes so that we don't um, have a stream of, of people continuing to add themselves to the list. So if you are in person and intending to speak on public comment, now is the time to get in your yellow card. We will close the queue when the first person begins speaking. For those of you who are on Zoom, you have a few additional minutes because we will close the Zoom queue when the first Zoom speaker begins. So if you're intending to speak on public comment and you're on Zoom, now would be an excellent time to raise your virtual hand. And with all of that, Colin, why don't you call the, the first five folks? All Thank right, you. let me call up the first five. Twee Fam, we have Joseph White, Chris Dixon, David Padilla, and Roxanne. So go, come on down and we'll take you one at a time. You'll have one minute to speak. Good afternoon. My name's Tui. I'm a senior auditor appraiser and a member of SEIU Local 521. I'm here on behalf of auditor appraisers in the business property division at the assessor's office who are seeking a wage alignment. To introduce us, we are a group of highly skilled and well-trained professionals in the field of accounting and auditing. Annually, we audit about 700 to 800 companies and businesses in the county with each audit going back to the last four years of financial records. We also process about over 30,000 business properties tax filings. The work is currently being done by 29 auditors who have been working six days a week since January, and we still have 11 vacancies to fill. So how does our work impact the county? Well, last year we were one of the main reasons that the assessor's office enrolled 620 billion in property value, and um, that is, um, on the side note, in 1995, the assessor's office, is it okay if I continue or? No, I'm sorry, we're allotting one minute to each speaker, thank I you. I understand, thank you for your time. Go ahead. Right, good afternoon, members of the board. My name is Joseph White. I'm a senior auditor appraiser and a member of SEIU Local 521. Um, the position of auditor appraiser is unique in that it requires the skills of both an auditor and an appraiser, which is two um, skill sets that are very complicated and require a lot of aptitude to be able to um, develop those skills. There's a widely reported national shortage of accountants currently. Having an accounting degree or being a certified accountant is a California constitutional requirement of this position. And we have presented our evidence to the negotiating team that shows Santa Clara County is not currently meeting the price point required to attract member uh, talent to this position. I started, um, I started with the county in 1996 as an intern. I volunteered with the county um, when I was a college intern under the survey uh, under the survey team to help with flood management and I've been serving as five years as an auditor appraiser. Um, we've been working extremely hard and thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Chris Dixon. I'm here with my coworkers today requesting support for a wage realignment in increase. Um, as you know, we've, been, we've suffered severe vacancies and it's affecting our ability to serve the county. The number of audits, audits per year have gone down and it's at $30,000 average per audit. It's costing this county $5 million per year. And it's not just audits, it's processing, failure to files by companies. We, we're not doing the job that we could be doing if we are fully staffed. We are at 75% capacity. Um, given the zero telework policy, the only way to, to recruit qualified candidates is, to, is the pay scale. We need to entice qualified candidates. Um, we're asking for a 12% increase. Investing in the auditor appraisers will have a return on investment. Uh, by doing so, tax money is literally falling through the county's fingers. And that money can be used to support public services. Um, if you increase the pay, you will entice the incentives for candidates to accept the position of auditor appraisers. That's simple. Thank you.
Hello, Supervisors. Uh, David Padilla, staff with uh, SAU 521 Organizer. Um, I'm just uh, going to read a, a letter of support from a community member named Michelle Burnham, clinical supervisor at Abode Services. Um, the health of the underserved, vulnerable population should be just as valued as those with privilege. For healthcare workers to be paid less for those same work, just because of the population they serve is an injustice. It also makes it difficult to retain and obtain good quality healthcare workers. Please consider a fair, equal wage based on the work that is provided, not on the po population that is being served. Sincerely, Michelle Burnham. I also just wanted to uh, add, you'll hear today from our members, just as you've heard in previous days, about common sense solutions to solving the staffing crisis. And so we really want to make sure that we continue to work together, as I've mentioned, and that Santa Clara County continue to be a leader in care um, in the country. Thank you. Good afternoon, Supervisors. My name is Roxanne, and I'm here on my personal behalf, not any of the hat, other hats I wear. This is a matter of civil rights. And you are presiding over a county that has institutionalized bigotry and hatred. I will say that again. Institutionalized bigotry and hatefulness. It's not, just look at the facts. 170 years, this county never, ever hired a trans woman. If that's not discrimination, how do you define discrimination? Now, with the help of Senator Dave Cortese and Supervisor Chavez, we cracked that. But we're talking about two or three hires in the county that are underneath organizations that, in a recent committee hearing, said, my life experience is worthless, not even a criteria to be considered when hiring in this county. That's unacceptable. I'd like to call up the next uh, group of speakers, Sonia Hamos, Paul Williams, Robert Fortune, Tui Trong, and Fabri. Hi, my name is Sonia James, and I'm a public health nurse, and I'll be reading highlights from a comment submitted by a colleague in our communicable disease department. I witnessed how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted our staff and community members. Within my first month of joining, my department also faced the MPOX public health emergency while the COVID-19 response continued. While our team supported, worked to support this endeavor, staff from different departments were pooled for multiple months to cover. Regular operations became impacted. Throughout my full time with the department, our team has been unable to fill all positions and retain staff. This is not unique to my department. Poor staff retention has also made it challenging to provide the best services possible to the community. While I remain committed to providing the best possible care to the community, I recognize a need for improvement. We can improve the level of care with additional support from the Board of Supervisors. As the county looks to the future, please consider raising the funds, raising the wages of public health nurses to an equitable rate. Good afternoon. I have some excerpts to uh, share with you for a letter from my, one of my colleagues. My name is Todd Fong. I am a, a PCP with VHHP. Our job is to navigate the endless complexity of barriers that many of our chronically homeless patients suffer with. I've had the pleasure of working with a couple of PHNs in our program, and I cannot put into words how priceless they are to our mission. To be effective, a PHN must have a very unique set of skills, and the work they do is often much more important than what happens in the medical office. They are the eyes and the ears and the critical bridge to us as medical providers for countless patients who are too mentally ill or physically disabled to make it into clinic. There is a stark contrast in our ability to serve patients when we have a PHN as opposed to when we don't. PHNs fill a gap in health care that no other member of our staff can. PHNs have no less value to our work than other RNs. If anything, they are more uniquely skilled. They deserve equal pay, to say the least. We have seen an unprecedented level of engagement from our unhoused patients thanks to the PHN. If we cannot retain or even recruit PHNs to this line of work, ultimately it's the patients and the community that suffers. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Supervisors. My name is Fobui. I'm a psychiatric social worker, one with the Behavioral Health Department. I am here today asking the board to address the disparity and lack of respect for the psychiatric social workers and marriage family therapists. As we continue to face the mental health crisis as a result of the COVID pandemic and now the fentanyl pandemic in our community, there is a critical need for services, but the county is facing a staffing crisis, retentions, and vacancies because we are losing experienced clinicians to neighboring county and the private sectors. Please respect us and pay us. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, board supervisors. My name is Tui Chong. I'm a psychiatric social worker too and been with, working with the Santa Clara County for over 25 years. I'm here today to request you demand Santa Clara County to work with SEIU to realign our salaries so we can tr attract more quality and res more quality staff and resolve staffing crisis. As we all know, we are dealing with staff crisis and Santa Clara County has no retention plan and weight competitive. As social worker and MFT code itself, we have over 50% vacancies and get paid 17 lower wage compared to other counties. Um, public sectors like Santa Clara, um, San Mateo, Alameda, and VA, or private sectors, Kaiser, Good Sam, Stanford, and El Camino. As a result, CSPSKs, EPS, and in custody, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Robert Fortner. Um, I'm a custody support assistant at the main jail. I've been uh, working, I'm doing it about seven years. And uh, we've been faced with high turnover rates, vacant codes, and burnout. We, uh, a lot of people apply to be a CSA and they leave to become a deputy or other things. It's become a stepping stone. And the amount of churn is, there's a lot of it. Um, we lost 15 people in the past five years. And we currently, I see for the past two years, we haven't had a supervisor. So it's been one of the uh, sergeants has taken over along with all their other things. They're, they're doing it and they, they're doing their best, but a lot of the things we need a supervisor. So I'm uh, here to see what you guys can do to help us out. Thank you. I'd like to call up the next round of speakers. Raquel Bauer, Charlene Mahavali, Julia Prado, and Marilia. Step right up. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Raquel Bayer. I've been a physical therapist for 28 years and 13 years working for at VMC. It is concerning that VMC has become the training ground for new grads. 39 occupational speech and physical therapists combined left and went to our competitors for a better pay in the last three years. 19 out of 39 experienced clinicians were replaced by new grads because no experience applied for, experienced therapists applied for the job. High turnover and difficulty with retention and recruitment directly impact our, the community we serve. Waitlist in outpatient therapy in two to three months, uh, waitlist is between two to three months because of staffing shortage. Our underserved population is depending on the county hospitals for the therapy service. They have developed serious problems by the time we see them because treatment was delayed. Our spinal cord and brain injury rehab is ranked number 11 in the nation and has to limit admissions because of the staffing shortage. 50 to 75 patients a day. Okay, thank you. Hello. I'm here to speak again, and although this is nerve-wracking, we have to do it for our people. My name is Charlene Mahabali. I'm an MFD2. I wanted to talk about parity. Parity means the state or the condition of being equal, especially regarding status or pay. When will the county do this? There is so much I want to say and ask why so many SEIU workers are not respected like RNPA, the doctors, or DOC staff. Why do select a few, such as the DAs, the rehab officers, get 10% for retention, but the MFTs and PS2, PSWs have a 62% vacancy issue. We have a recruitment and retention issue, but we're still ignored. 
we are doing our best to address the mental health, fentanyl, and opioid crisis. As long as my, part, my brother here with S, um, custody support, we're in that building doing the best that we can, but what will the board do to help us? What will you do to help us with parity? Thank you. And happy birthday and congratulations. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Julia Prado. I work at the mammography department in VMC and have been there for 12 years. I'm here to speak on how our 50% vacancy is directly impacting women's health. VMC Mammo performed 2,064 less mammograms, underserving Santa Clara County's women in the last year. This year, we are on the same downward spiral, underserving 580 women since January of 2023. These underserved women are at risk of breast cancer diagnosis, and if caught on time, they would survive. Mammal's 50% vacancy crisis is severely delaying patient care, diagnosis, and treatment in a diagnosis where time is of the essence and where time is strictly federally regulated. VMC Mammal staffs 15 shifts in seven clinics across the county. Our severe staffing shortage has resulted in management cutting shifts and currently closing clinics. Please help us stop closures, staff mammography, and prioritize women's health. Thank you. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Mauri Lea Lovano. I'm a member of 521 Negotiations, and I'm also a recipient of the Valley Health Plan Medical Services Mammography. In light of the mammography staffing shortage, I want to highlight some facts regarding breast cancer. For one, it is one of the most curable forms of cancer. Second, mammography is one of the least invasive forms of screening and diagnosis. And third, I want to leave you with this fact. One in eight women will be diagnosed with this disease in their lifetime. If you look around this room, that would probably be about seven women. Please address women's health and make it a priority and staff our mammography. They're, um, they're in dire need of this service. Thank you. We currently have 14 speakers online. I'll just remind folks uh, quickly that once the first speaker on Zoom begins speaking, we'll close that queue. So if you intend to speak on public comment but haven't yet raised your virtual hand, please do so now. And we currently have 15 requests to speak. If it's still rising, hang on for a second. If it's holding at 15, we can start. All right. <laughs> It's holding at 15 for, for now. All right, okay. 15 it is. Thank you so much, Colin. All right, our next speaker is Alyssa Granada. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Alyssa Granada. I'm a marriage and family therapist too, working at the main jail. And this is my third time speaking in front of the board this week. You have heard about the mental health crisis in the jails all week. But I bet what you did not know is that in between all of these meetings, there was yet another attempted suicide in one of our facilities. Just add that to the growing list of attempted and completed suicides in our jails just this year. We are not just fighting for us, but we are fighting for our community members who need essential care. With vacancies, retention issues, and hazardous working conditions, we are unable to provide the best care possible to our clients. I urge the board to stop perpetuating mental health stigma and respect the roles of MSTs and PSWs in this county. Retain the MFTs and PSWs you already have because if it has not already been made clear, no one wants to work here. Custody Health has failed time and time again to hire more MFTs and PSWs. Alameda County MFTs and PSWs working in their jail are paid 25% more than us, despite Santa Clara County having a higher rate of incarceration. Our next speaker is Beatrice Ballesteros Kogan. You'll have one minute, one minute to speak. Timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon. My name is Beatriz Ballesteros Kogan. I'm a psychiatric social worker within the Family and Children Division. I pride myself in the work that I do, and I believe in providing families that we serve with the best standards of care. Our country has faced numerous traumatic events in the recent years, including the pandemic, mass shootings, and a violent political turmoil. Our nation is facing a mental health crisis. Sadly, Santa Clara County has been losing and continues to lose 
qualified clinicians, both psychiatric social workers and MFTs, as a result of burnout and low wages. We presently have astronomical number of vacancies in the Department of Behavioral Health. Those of us who continue to come to work every day are facing insurmountable demands. The impacts of this impacts retention of qualified clinicians, as well as having a negative impact in our ability to serve the community. There are youth and families that are waiting for services, and the longer the delay, the more possibility for a crisis to occur. It's imperative to show respect to clinicians that work diligently and passionately to serve the most vulnerable members of our The next speaker is Samantha Chen. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Samantha, please accept the unmute and you'll be ready to go. All right. I think Samantha might be unable to mute. We'll okay. move. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Samantha Chen, MFT2 from Sunnyvale Children Youth and Family Programs. I'm here to represent all my team clinicians. We sincerely ask for your support to recognize and solve the problems of the 62% vacancies for MFT and PSW 1 and 2. There has been an increasingly high number of county residents needing mental health care and other social service support. However, as we accompany our young clients and their families through reaching out for various assistance throughout the system, we face a reality that servicing agencies are full due to limited staffing. The limitation exacerbates clients' mental health conditions and added to their feelings of hopelessness and powerlessness. On the other hand, the service providers share the burden of having to treat clients with mental health symptoms that are unprecedentedly severe, along with family problems that, are, that stem from the struggles of surviving in a high living cost community where there is a large... The next speaker is Rich Ruiz. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, thank you for your time. My name is Rich Ruiz, and I'm a communications dispatcher three with Santa Clara County Communications and a member of SCIU 521. I wish to address the critical staffing problems facing our department by asking you one question. What will happen if nobody is there to answer the call in a timely fashion if the panic alarm is activated in the Board of Supervisors chambers? Who's the first person you're calling to find out where, how, and why that failure took place? Is critical staffing for emergency services going to be a priority then? As a countywide hub for emergency communications, our 911 center blew up the day of the Santana Row fire back in 2002 in a recent history. The atmospheric river storms earlier this year, the four alarm structure fire in Campbell of March of last year, the VTA shooting in May of 2021, and the Gilroy Garlic Festival shooting in July of 2019. The reality is it's only a matter of time before one of these unfortunate events happens again. Do you really want to be ill-prepared? Thank you. The next speaker is Diana Trin. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Diana Trin, and I'm a psychiatric social worker working at Alexian Health Clinic in addiction medicine. I want to appeal to the board to consider an above average realignment for our budget. We not only have a mental health crisis, but as Supervisor Chavez has been increasing awareness on a fentanyl crisis. My clients are mostly folks struggling with opioid addictions and our services across the three county addiction medicine clinics have been greatly impacted by the shortage of marriage and family therapists and psychiatric social workers. We recently lost two counselors and that leaves our remaining counselors with even higher caseloads. We cannot provide adequate care to our clients and patients coming into our clinics when we are overworked and burnt out. I humbly ask that the board please realign our salaries to be competitive to attract and retain good talent so that we may provide the care that is aligned with the county values to provide quality services and promote a healthy, safe, and prosperous community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janice Clark. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, I'm a psychiatric social worker too for the Central Valley Clinic for the addiction medicine treatment. I'm a colleague of Diana Tran and I'm only reiterating what she has stated. 
that high vacancy rate has caused longer wait time and suffering for our patients, which is negatively impacting our communities. The MFTs and PSWs are leaving for higher wages, higher sign-on bonuses, incentives, and a work-life balance. I urge the Board of Supervisors to not only invest in the employees, but also to invest in our patients and our communities by supporting the MFT PSW realignment proposal. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tara Huff. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Um, regarding realignment, uh, my name is Tara Huff. I'm a psychiatric social worker too. Uh, with the uh, Santa Clara County Behavioral Health at the Collaborative Courts and a member of SEIU 521. Um, some of you might not fully understand our role, so I'll briefly explain. Um, I assess and write referrals to link people to, with mental health, substance use, criminal justice involvement, and uh, homelessness to services. I provide crisis intervention therapy. I diagnose and initiate evaluations for involuntary psychiatric holds. Ultimately, however, uh, we assist vulnerable people while they are working to restore their adaptive functioning in the community. We are an invisible adhesive. Um, mental health, substance use, and homelessness are on the voters' minds these days as our society is in transition. It is my hope that in your budget, budget considerations, you understand our importance and therefore our recruitment and retention. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laura Villarreal. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, esteemed members of the board. My name is Laura Villarreal. I'm a senior communications dispatcher at County 901 Communications. Been here for 20 years, and we are here to reiterate our request for your support on investing in our workforce and your vote on the proposed deletions to positions that are providing vital services to our community, like 911 communications, health and hospitals, behavioral health and social services. Our department has been staffing our vacancies with mandatory overtime for the past 11 years, and our 911 desk often goes unfilled, unfortunately with management not following their own policies for minimum operational staffing. We need this board to continue working with us to address and resolve these issues as it affects not only our hardworking, dedicated employees, but the public safety as well when we're unable to give our usual 110% on the job on a daily basis. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Kimberly. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, everyone on the members of the board. My name is Kimberly Wendt, and I am a 911 dispatcher communications operator three with the County of Santa Clara. And to back, piggyback onto Laura and Rich's request, our seriously understaffed department, which we are the true first first responder, we're the ones that get people to your homes, regardless of whether it's fire, EMS, or police. And we cannot do our jobs effectively when we have 19 open slots or more on a regular basis. Our management has fixed the problem with what they call mandatory overtime, which means those of us who are full-time dispatchers work an average of 32 to 36 hours a month to be able to help staff the problem. We want you to consider not cutting any of our positions. The next speaker is Sonia Solano. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. And Sonia, I'll need you to unmute the microphone and you can start speaking. One more try for Sonia. Okay, uh, we'll try to go back to Sonia. The next speaker is Janet Caudill. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, thank you for your time, Board of Supervisors. My name is Janet Cadillo, and I work as a PSW2 with the Behavioral Health Services Department and the Crisis and Services Division. I am here to request a wage realignment for PSWs and MFTs. We work with youth who have high acuity needs as a result of going through severe trauma in their young life. 
At this time, there is a 60 plus vacancy rate for staff, and this is greatly impacting the quality and quantity of services that we are able to provide to the community and to these high risk youth. There is a high turnover rate and staff that have remained are experiencing burnout. Providing quality mental health services continues to be a priority to us, but we need the proper staffing to be able to serve the community in a fair and equitable manner. My coworkers are searching for other jobs at this time because our county doesn't pay equitable wages compared to other surrounding counties. We are asking for an above average PSW MFT realignment that is truly needed during this difficult time to retain the dedicated workers who have remained at the county. I am imploring you to assist us with allocating more funding to retain the next speaker is Jason Majors. Please accept the unmute. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, my name is Jason Majors. I am an MFT2, and I just wanted to underscore the staffing crisis along with increased workloads that are leading clinicians to seek employment elsewhere. Luckily for the county, most clinicians here enjoy serving their community. Luck is not a sustainable plan or tactic. When it comes to hiring and retention, clinicians are easily in $30,000 more a year at other hospitals nearby in the area and are often able to make more than $200,000 a year working in private practice with far less than an hour a week school, often even being able to work 20 hours a week on their own terms. In order to retain the work, MFT PSW realignment needs to be above average. Neighboring sectors get paid at least $10 more an hour than us, making it difficult to continue serving the community or making a decision to stay work county. Please make P MFT PSW priority in order to continue serving our community, also in order to demonstrate that luck is not a fair tactic. The next speaker is Marisol Fernandez. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, my name is Marisol Fernandez. I'm a psychiatric social worker too, currently working at the main jail. One of the key topics of the remedial plan is for our county jails to have adequate staff and resources to provide 24 hour access to mental health providers, as well as having individuals be seen within appropriate times for assessments, services, and post follow-ups for inmates that were removed from suicide watch. These assessments are to be made within 24 hours, 72 hours, and one week timeframe. However, we are short 70, 17 clinicians between Elmwood and the main jail, and the number just keeps rising. Currently, we find ourselves with only one clinician working booking and crisis simultaneously. This is a job that used to be done by at least four clinicians. As a result, the majority of our follow-up assessments are falling behind. Referrals that should be seen within 24 hours are at times being seen days later. With continued loss of clinicians, the remedial plan will not be in compliance. We ask that the county assist us in keeping our clinicians by providing more lucrative incentives this will assist in both keeping our current clinicians and attracting new ones. And that concludes our request to speak. There we go, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move to item 88, which is board requests for information. I'd like to go right to public comment uh, first on this item and then um, come back to my colleagues. We currently have no requests to speak in person or online on item 88. Which is fine, but I don't know if I caught any, it caught people off guard. Um, so let's just give that a, a, a second. This is item 88, board requests for information. Uh, we're going to start with public comment if there is any, uh, so that the board has all information Available we, for the conversation. We oh. do have one request to speak. Oh, okay. In person or in? Uh, one on person Zoom? virtually, okay. none in the room. Okay, uh, so. Um, two minutes. One person uh, is, is, is of course just fine. I'm just reminding people if you intend to speak on this item, now's the time to raise your hand. When our virtual speaker begins speaking, we'll close the short queue. All right. Our next speaker is Janet Cardillo. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. I'm sorry, I meant to um, lower my hand, sorry. Oh, no problem. problem. That's, that ends request to speak. All right, thank you. Then I will turn uh, to my colleagues for any uh, comments on 88. Um, is there looking first to Dr. Smith and or Greg, do you want to make some opening <clears throat> statements? Colin, can you? Uh... 
put this up. Great, thank you. Um, this um, is on item 88 on the um, agenda, the supplemental item A, page four. I'd like to go through a little bit of this discussion to explain um, staff's perspective and the board asked us to give additional options for action. We'll get to that at the very end. Um, this issue rises from um, a request or suggestion from Harvey Rose, um, number 17 in their re recommendations. Um, let me try to explain a little bit from the beginning um, and we'll then take questions. As you know, a major part of our recommendation to, to balance this budget has to do with deleting uh, vacant funded positions. Um, however, at VMC, we felt that there were some critical services that needed uh, new positions uh, right away because they were of such importance. As we administratively looked through the remaining positions available after the deletions, uh, we felt that we needed to add new positions in order to get those programs up and running expeditiously. The difference of opinion between uh, Harvey Rose and the administration, I think, was clearly outlined yesterday as um, an opinion that the programs were important, but Harvey Rose felt we could find vacant positions in other parts of the budget that could substitute. So initially, Harvey Rose um, recommended these space or positions going down to um, the bottom here of 34 to be not created. Um, you can see the services that they would be intended to, to provide over on the far left. They include expanding services in the mental health or medical clinic at O'Connor, expanding pharmacy staffing, probably the most important, number three, increasing the quality incentive pool program. This is a program that will determine future supplemental payments. Um, basically, in the future, our supplemental payments are gonna be linked to our quality improvement statistics, and this is a critical function for us. Um, the other um, four, five, and six are establishing a women's urgent care clinic, um, expanding rehab services, which is also important for finances as well as service because this is an area where we get many patients who are covered by other insurance. Um, and then increasing some support for uh, the inpatient services to provide um, services that were just discussed by one of the speakers, and then two administrative staff. Subsequently, um, Harvey Rose came back and removed some of these um, suggestions. And so over in the, the column listed as FY24 recommended, the only ones that we differ with Harvey Rose about are the ones that are in yellow. And that amounts to 25 and a half FTEs. Now, again, what the Harvey Rose presumption is, is that we can find other positions to support these services. They're not saying these services are unimportant. As a matter of fact, I would suggest that probably Cheryl would uh, agree they are important. Um, what we're administratively uh, concerned about is we think that we've already um, eliminated a number of services or a number of positions of the same classification that are of a lower priority than these particular projects. So you can see over at the far right what's already being recommended for deletion. Now, 
In these three listed at, columns listed as current budgeted, current filled, and current vacant, I want to point out that these numbers are from um, April and May. And we've noted that there have been a lot of changes since April and May, so that um, the linkage between uh, the ability to fill these positions with current vacant positions is not at all clear. Um, the reason it's delayed is because we're constantly hiring and con people are constantly leaving, moving, being promoted, and it's really, the only way you can really tell what positions you have left over is by um, working with the department and the managers, and you know we have not uh, been able to crosswalk that. So, um, what we're presented then with is from a budgetary perspective, these positions, all of them, are backfilled by revenue. As a matter of fact, they're more than backfilled by revenue. As I mentioned, number three, the quality incentive program is responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars of funding. All of the clinical uh, uh, positions are directly connected with revenue. If we don't create these positions, then in the budget, what would happen is the positions would be, recommendation for adding the positions would be removed, the revenue would be removed, and there'd be no um, change to the general fund. So we have in your packet two options for budgetary action, and I have two suggestions for um, action that might address some of the concerns that Supervisor uh, Simidian expressed and some of the other board members expressed. In terms of budgetary action, there is really the choice of actually going with the administration's recommendation or the um, Harvey Rose recommendation, and you'll see that later on in the budget tabulations you have a choice to make. However, there was concern about whether or not there would be vacant filled positions that were assigned to other projects that were of less priority so they could be moved over to these projects. At this point, I can't tell you for sure that that's true. Um, Harvey Rose's recommendation is that it is true. Um, as I said, we'd have to work with the departments and um, the new, new uh, position numbers to be sure. So one option for the board operationally to address the uh, concerns raised by Harvey Rose is to uh, go ahead and approve the staff's recommendation, but direct us to come back in September 1st um, with a outline of what filled vacant positions could be moved into these um, projects and therefore would be removed because the projects, the positions that you see here would be created. So we'd have a net zero in terms of the position and the budget. Um, that's one option. Another option is to increase the um, amount of um, time between the creation of the positions and the filling of the positions. Um, we um, could increase it to f four months, um, which would mean that the positions would be created but would not be filled for four months. Um, so from an administration perspective, we would recommend that we move ahead with the administration's proposal. However, I think we can address the concerns raised by some of the board members by having us not fill the positions until we come back with a list of other vacant funded positions that could be substituted. 
because I think the thing that we all agree with, Harvey Rose, the administration, the board, is that these services are critical and we don't want to, you know, handicap the provision of the services. So we do not recommend um, preventing the creation of these positions um, as that would require us to make sure that we move positions that we can't reliably say at this time are lower priority. So um, that's what I've got for this. I'll take it down and then we have some other issues on 88 or whichever if you want to discuss this individually. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Supervisor Lee? I'm ready for motion for item 17 if uh, my colleagues is okay with it. Go right ahead. Yeah, I would just like to go ahead and move staff recommendation to come back in September 1st to evaluate what's the uh, filled vacant positions uh, and what could be substituted and uh, we'll move more that way if I can get a second. I'll second it. We have a motion by Lee, second by Simidian. Uh, Supervisor Lee, did you want to add anything else? Sure. I mean, basically, as the uh, county executive has mentioned, uh, these positions, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for Cheryl for your hard work of uh, looking for all these, and we have great respect for the recommendations always from the auditors. Um, in this specific instance, I do believe that these positions uh, that has been um, mentioned in item 17, uh, I'm glad that administration has been able to first of all come back so quickly to identify the, uh, the individually what they are and how important it is. And the thing that, that convinced me why I think this is the right thing to do is the fact that they also are not only backfilled by reimbursement, but potentially be, quote, money making uh, on these positions. And of course, since these are positions that won't, not only would it be uh, reimbursed, but potentially uh, um, be revenue positive, in addition to the fact that obviously these are positions will provide really important services at the BMC and the medical uh, side. So I, I certainly do believe that uh, this would be a good way to do it, and especially for that fact that we put down the caveat of coming back on September 1st to reevaluate uh, some of these positions we need to be substituted. I think that's a very um, wise way to, to manage this, so I, I would uh, urge my colleagues to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas, then Chavez. Then Chavez. I wanted uh, the, the motion to be repeated, please. Sure. It's to, <clears throat> what we would like to do is to move to, um, uh, on item number 17, on those positions, to uh, follow the staff recommendations uh, on creating those positions. But we are going to come back on September 1st to reevaluate what, which of those positions uh, might have been filled. Uh, and at that point, we could potentially resubstitute uh, which one we actually might be able to uh, delete if we were able to save money. But we won't deal with that until after September 1st. So um, let me just clarify. So um, uh, basically option one, follow option one, mm -hmm. and then return in September, uh, evaluate uh, the positions that have been filled and have not been filled. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, uh, the evaluation would lead us to e eliminate um, positions or at that point if they the could be substituted then we would then decide what to do with them and if it's not necessary then we could eliminate them but if obviously if they're still necessary we'll leave them there yeah mm -hmm. Correct. Oh, okay thank you mm -hmm. supervisor Chavez so yes um, I I just want to make sure that I understand very clearly what action we're taking, and I apologize, Dr. Smith, I, I followed and read this document, but I wanna make sure I, I understand it. So first, what you're suggesting, or what the motion would do, is leave the original staff's direction intact, coming back to the board in September to or to, with, a, with a, a mechanism for us to look at this to determine whether or not there were other vacant or fill, I'm sorry, other filled positions that then vacant. could be moved into these um, categories. Vacant funded positions. Vacant other. funded positions that essentially would be duplicates. Right. Or, uh, basically, or we're taking, I mean, I don't want to speak for <coughs> Cheryl, but I think it's fair to say that, you know, we all think these services are important. 
Um, and the question is, are there vacant positions that are funded in elsewhere in the budget that could be substituted for creating these? Got it. What I'm so saying they're fungible. Is, right. Okay. So what I'm saying is let's wait until September to evaluate that and be able to tell you what other funded vacant positions could be substituted or if they're no longer needed because we filled these positions to eliminate them, to delete them. I understand. And, and that, um, so you should ask Cheryl if I'm saying anything crazy. <laughs> well, she's too nice to say it, but I would tell you if you were saying something crazy. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I understood the motion, but go ahead, Cheryl. All right. um, I just want to be clear that our recommendation is not specific to a given position. We're just trying to look at the overall picture, and <clears throat> in the column on the on the right of the table that was shown, those are the positions that would continue to be vacant and funded in the adopted budget, um, plus the new positions. So there would be about, for example, 50 new, 50 vacant funded positions for licensed vocational nurses in the budget. But if they're gonna come back in September with a proposal to change it, you know, we'll, if if you want us to look at that, we can look at that then. I think that would be that would be really helpful. Is just to make sure that the that prior to the report coming back, that there is a meeting with the auditor's office to see if there's shared mm -hmm. understanding, and if there isn't, if two reports need to come to the board, that we would be open to that. If is that okay with the maker of the motion? Absolutely. And the seconder as well. Yes. Thank you. And then I, I have a comment on it just in general on um, on this uh, document, and this goes back to what Susan, what you wanted me to wait till next two Tuesdays from so now sorry. to say. Yes. But no, 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 that's all right. I I just wanted to suggest that um, that we begin a similar discussion for next year's budget on the items in front of us because what when I went back to look at one of the um, off agenda reports. It was, it was somewhat difficult for me to understand why certain positions were um, eliminated and others weren't, particularly where there was money at, assigned to them and also potentially um, goals or legislative outcomes. And so as part of when we talk about this on Tuesday, I just want to sunshine that in September, I actually want to have a discussion about the the actions taken today and and what this will look like in the coming year because I do think there needs to be something much more um, formulaic and a little bit more transparent just so we understand if there's money we're leaving on the table that we understand that we're doing that or if there are activities that we're going to be opting out of that the board just understands that more robustly. So the level of detail that you actually went in for this to me would have been valuable with a number of offices, and you did do that in some of the off-agenda reports, but I just think it should actually be part of the budgeting process, and I really think we have to have that conversation September, October, not April, May, June. It's just too much, too late, and I, I feel like the consternation of the folks who spoke earlier, but who've left, but the, the stress they have about the, that, and, um, and I think part of it is probably a little bit of the same challenge I'm having around understanding the the strategy that we're using. So, but I think this is a very good direction and really appreciate the detail that came back. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. Um, because I am the newest member of the board, I, um, I get to appreciate, I think, the process in a different light. Um, and one of the things that I come across is, is an, uh, and I agree with your, your comments about uh, establishing a, a process that is a budget process that's transparent and that we can um, ahead of time agree what what are the what the outcomes are and how the outcomes are aligning with priorities that we've agreed to and voted uh, previously right and how 
all of that is, is lining up. Uh, I would love to see that at some point um, um, really, uh, really outlined. And I know that uh, President Ellenberg, you, you're making a, an effort to standardize a lot of, um, of our processes and have suggested an ad hoc at, at, or earlier at another um, meeting. And so with this, I, I also think, how, how do we have a, a, a check and balance in terms of, uh, of the information that we receive and how do we know um, whether we have all of the information in order to make the best decision? And so part of the, a part of this information that I actually really benefited from was uh, the Harvey and Rose um, audit. Although I, I think you all stated that you're, um, it wasn't a full-fledged comprehensive uh, audit in terms of the health and hospital, and, and you're, this is not your area of expertise. And so I, I would like to see at some point um, some sort of evaluation on uh, the vacancies and, and how um, some of those positions are um, how they fund themselves, basically, is, is what um, I understand the concept to be, um, how we bottom line it. I don't quite understand it just yet, other than I know that we have some reimbursements that eventually pay for our, these positions, but I'd love to learn more about how that works. And, and so maybe in September, when we return, we can have a bit of that um, educational piece to it, that element for us to understand, um, so that we, when we get these audits from, from Harvey and Rose, or if there's any further aud audits coming through the Health and Hospitals Committee, that we are all on the same page in terms of knowledge. And I only say that for myself because I, I feel like I'm not. I, I'm just not there yet, and, uh, and I do want to um, understand this um, a, a little more nuanced than what I do right now. And so I'm hoping that we can add that to the motion Wonderful, um, and, and really that is it. I'm glad that we've come to this decision. I um, I was a little nervous about um, not funding some of uh, our positions because as you all know, there is some expansion in South County that I'm um, very protective about, and I think we're all very protective as you have all uh, contributed to the the health and well-being of, of South County uh, previous to me being here for six months. So so I know that you're all very much invested. And so anyways, I, I appreciate um, what we have on the floor and I'll be uh, supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Lee, an additional comment? No, I just want to uh, say thanks uh, again for uh, for staff and also especially Sher uh, Cheryl for the great work on putting together these um, items. And uh, after this vote, I just also want to clarify, um, is there any more remaining um, loose ends we need to tie up for 15th and 16th as well? Or that one's basically dealt with and we're good to go? I just want to check with administration. No, I think 15 and 16 are tied up. I think okay. the next thing you have is 11. Okay, all right, so we'll just vote on this on 17 for now. That's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Um, are we ready for a vote on, on 88? 88A, right, 88A. So let's, let's do an, an individual vote on this item, please. Right. Supervisor Arenas? Yes. Supervisor Chavez? Supervisor Seminian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Elmer. Yes. Motion carries, thank you. Thank you very much. Back to you, Dr. Smith. I'm gonna turn over uh, the rest of the presentation to uh, uh, County Budget Director Greg Aturia. Okay, thank you. Uh, Greg Aturia, County uh, Budget Director. And 88B uh, and 88C are related. It is the uh, final uh, response to questions that were posed um, by the board prior to the beginning of the budget hearings, and the request is to receive the requested information. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I wanted to um, just thank the staff for the, the report back. It was very helpful and very clear. 
The one request that I wanted to ask is that um, the on this particular item that the staff um, add dates with each of the actions that are being taken. And in particular, there was one of completing the county's an um, assessment of county-owned properties, and I feel like this has been going on for years, so I am really interested in this one with a, a date on it. So if the off agenda can just be updated with um, dates would be very helpful on that item. And then there's another item, which is 88D, which we can take them together if that's helpful, because they both kind of hit on the same subject. Um, and this was the Housing and Homeless Incentive Program. I, I really wanted to thank the staff for getting us the information that was requested. Um, and it, it does look like this is a little further along than, than, um, than perhaps I knew. I do have one question about the, um, the process, or maybe not the process, but the, um, the next steps with the final expenditure plan. And I don't know if there's anybody here who could respond to that. Great key, thank you. So first, I, I wanted to say um, to my colleagues how much I appreciated that our staff has really hung in there to, uh, to encourage people to actually fund the plan we already have since we did so much work on the plan. Having new plans would be problematic. Um, the one thing that, that um, and, and also to see that there's a significant amount of resources that will go into that, that system, uh, Two, well, actually, two questions I have. On, on uh, page 405, there's an, a recognition of the of 3.7 million needed for infrastructure relative to data analysis training and working with county departments. I, I wasn't sure what this really referred to because it talks about um, it talks about the electronic health record. So I'm, I wasn't sure if this is a training for everybody so everybody knows how to use the databases that we're using. And that's for nonprofits or all of us or who that's aimed at. Um, thank you for the question, Supervisor Chavez. Um, uh, you may recall that we have had a longstanding goal of, of trying to ensure that we ask all individuals the same types of housing questions at when they you know, um, visit their doctor or when they go to sign up for general assistance to ask the same type of housing questions and have the same types of drop down responses um, so that we can develop a better understanding and a more uniform understanding of people's housing status and whether or not they're unhoused. And then, of course, if they're unhoused, then sort of then um, working with them to do uh, referring them or having them um, complete the proper assessments for housing supports. And so, so, so those funds are all about, primarily about working with training staff and then um, making any modifications to our various management information systems to allow for that. That's really fabulous. What a great use of that money. And then <laughs> the last thing is, is that um, on the last page when it talks about the final expenditure plan, it it has this line that says, and we'll include additional funding for homeless prevention and street medicine for um, funding for temporary interim housing and supporting improvements to the supportive ho housing system by building capacity and some other um, kind of lovely words around equity. So really the question that I wanted to ask was, if, if we're focusing on prevention, I'm presuming that means that we're gonna be using the last few uh, point in time counts to to drive that. And so what I want to make sure that, that I'm just saying aloud is that um, if we're seeing a growth in family homelessness, I, I, I want to double down and say that I don't think we have a very strong mechanism for determining when a family's at risk. And what I would really like to see us taking a look at is whether that's through schooling services or all the other investments we're making in schools, that there is a much deeper connection to our um, homeless programming and to the schools, particularly for not just McKinney Vento, but those who could become in that, you know, become homeless. So um, that's one area that I just really want to say that if we have some funding that's slightly flexible, if it gives us the opportunity to dig into that, I really want to prioritize that. I, uh, so that's, that's one issue. And then coupled with that, the explosive 
e expansion of seniors that are becoming homeless. And we have that, you know, we have the senior plan to end homelessness and we have a network of senior agencies. And again, I don't necessarily understand how they're connected to our prevention activities in either group. Um, th thank you. Um, on, on the first uh, question around homeless families, um, I, I think that uh, the Office of Supportive Housing um, has been looking at how to ensure that there are better linkages. The next quarterly report on heading home is June 27th, so I'm not sure that they'd be prepared to uh, respond to your question specifically, but uh, we'll ask them to respond sort of in, in September or October in the, in the subsequent quarterly report. Um, on the seniors, I, I think we'll have to consider that question and, and determine how best to provide information to the board about how we are making services uh, more available to seniors who are unstably housed. And one request that I would just make key is that I think being as specific as we can be about the tools that we're using or trying to use and to be very forthcoming about the opportunities we have with our partners or that we don't have so that we don't put I don't want to put unrealistic ex expectations on our on our partners but like as an example you know we have groups like Healthier Kids Foundation and others that are out in the schools doing screenings for all kinds of things um, I, this may actually fit into the the 3.7 that you talked about but we're we're funding a lot of activities that I don't know if they're all aligning quite where we need them to. And so I'll look forward to learning more about that with some specificity. I, I'm happy to put um, a motion on the floor to receive 88 C and D with the um, request to have a more refined understanding of, of how we're working on prevention with families and seniors and that we get dates on the reentry housing program um, activities just so we know when there should be an expectation of completed activity. Supervisor Chavez, do you mean B and D? I'm sorry, I did. Okay. I, well, no, I meant. No, you didn't mean you C. You know what? Maybe I tabbed my papers wrong. There are a lot of tabs here. So you're right. B and C. Oh, B and D. That's B and D. exactly right. Okay. Thank and you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Motion by Chavez, second by Aranis. Uh, Supervisor Lee, then Aranis for additional comments. Uh, so is this going to, um, in terms of process question, uh, uh, <clears throat> Madam President, the, are we going to vote on all uh, 88 BCD at the same time? Yes, I can th throw them all in. I, I didn't, on, on item C, uh, colleagues, I have that as um, an attachment. So I'm, I'm, I have to say, my biggest challenge with budget every year is how we number stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, and so what I have is the housing and homeless incentive program, the, um, and then item C is really just the recommended, an update on the recommended actions, but I'm happy to take, uh, just for lack of confusion, B, C, and D all together as a receive report with some direction. If that's okay with the seconder. Yes. Anything else, Supervisor Yes, Lee? and I, will, I have a few uh, items I just want to clarify to make sure that we get, uh, not, don't miss anything that we've talked about previously. Um, recall, uh, Supervisor Chavez has earlier requested to roll over the remaining balance for the board office budgets. Uh, I just want to make sure that got that um, proposal was also included in this revised final budget uh, amendment beforehand. I will be making a referral to the board on for our um, 27th meeting. And that was the, the recommended um, process that was given by the budget director. So I'll okay. bring that, and I'll be bringing something that is allows all board offices if they would like to opt out instead of opt in. Okay, so that would be taken care of in the future. So we want to deal with it yeah, at this time. Thank you for catching that. Sure, okay, mm -hmm. so that's one. Um, and then there's a couple of items I just want to mention uh, as, as, as just to make sure that we don't lose, leave loose ends. I'm very concerned about that. So one of which is regarding the <clears throat> specific issue of the residential treatment providers. Uh, I know our administration is taking a look at this approach for the residential treatment programs, and I would certainly would like to get a report back uh, at mid-year with the information about provider rates and possible adjustment that might need to be made. I recognize that we are both nonprofit and private treatment providers, and they may have different needs. As we have declared mental health and substance use 
as a public health crisis and are working with nonprofit providers on the cost of doing business increase on their contracts, as we mentioned in the last meeting, I would like to request a report to come back at mid-year to see if there might be adjustments for all residential treatment providers as well under that uh, same issues. Is that something we can do, Greta? We're definitely happy to come back at mid-year and talk about what um, cost of doing business uh, work we've done with our providers and any adjustments to the contracts that we think are warranted based on that work and appreciate the opportunity to come back on it because it's quite complex um, and we need to get it right. So thank you. Okay. Um, and then the, based on some of these comments we heard today, <clears throat> and I believe this was something that we have um, uh, dealt with on consent a few meetings ago, the board has also adopted a proposal to alternatively, alternatively, uh, alternately staff all psychiatric social worker and marriage and family uh, therapist positions, the um, PSW and MFT positions with some unclassified rehabilitation counselors uh, that there's not enough positions being available for interns in either field to stay with the county while they uh, await the licensure. Um, I, I just want to, to uh, go back with that uh, uh, proposal uh, issues and it's something to, for staff to come back to us because obviously there's a lot of in, um, interest on the issue. Um, if this is something that could come back to us to look at again either in August or September. Yes, one of the um, regular report backs we'll be doing as part of our um, behavioral health report out to the board, um, part of our cadence is reporting back on workforce strategies, one of which being trying to, to do a better job of retaining folks that we've trained and making sure they can become a permanent part of our workforce so we can include in our um, next workforce update whatever there is to report out on the effectiveness of that strategy. Yeah, thank you. I, I certainly don't want to <clears throat> lose uh, our very uh, uh, well-trained uh, folks from our, our department losing, no, train them and then lose them to our competitors. That's the last thing I want to see. All right, and I believe that might have covered my, the so-called loose ends I could think of. Thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Thank you. I, I had some questions about the Housing and Homeless Incentive Program. Um, I, I think it's wonderful um, that we are not um, recreating the wheel here and that um, and that we are leveraging this this money um, uh, through with anthem with the work with anthem um, and I'm wondering what what percentage if any would anthem um, maintain in, in within their own system or is this going completely um, to the M MCPs um, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, I believe your question is how much money would the MCPs retain of the HHIP? Well, no, uh, th this is outlined in your in your um, expenditure plan. But what I'm wondering is what percentage of the of the sixty thousand does Anthem receive, if any? Oh, oh what pr uh, proportion of the of the sixty million? I believe Anthem is only about ten percent of the. the of the total Medi-Cal beneficiaries, but I'm looking for others to correct me if that's incorrect. My understanding is that it's it's generally a, about 10%. There may be, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm actually looking at in the, okay, Paul is nodding that Anthem um, uh, is responsible for the um, managed care function for about 10% of Medi-Cal beneficiaries in our county. So that would be 10% of the 60 million, What what is their, going to be their pass-through fee for this. I, I just, you know, I, if we could I see have Paul yeah, approaching I, the desk. If you can answer it today yeah. or in that second part of the plan, I'm sorry. I can. Kate. The um, our, our staff are saying that it's about 20% for the HHIP. Oh, it's about 20%? Yeah. That Anthem retains. Uh, I'm like well, that, repeating what the you're saying. The $60 million dollars uh -huh. can be earned by the MCPs. Right. Collectively. Right. And Anthem's portion is about 20% of that 60 million, but all of that 60 million is a part of this expenditure plan. Right, and I think at this point, they've received about 80, I think it was 88% of what they submitted, correct? Um, so they're still roughly well, waiting for about 3 million in incentives. Um, the, they have received 
t in total about uh, 27.2 million. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they could have earned approximately 30 million. Um, it is unclear yet why they did not earn the full 30 million. Um, and the, the balance of the 30 million, the balance of the 60 million, is yet to be earned because the performance period for that incentive or that milestone has not yet been. Um, it, well, it doesn't, uh, doesn't come up until um, October of 2023. Okay. Um, and then how does, how does Kaiser, how is Kaiser going to fit into this picture um, as they become um, another option for managed care, for Medi-Cal managed care? Um, I, uh, statewide, I mean. Um, I don't know the answer to that. The, um, right now, only the Anthem and um, Blue, um, Family Health Plan are the MCPs that are um, um, a part of the HHIP. Mm -hmm. You don't anticipate that they would also have um, an option? I, I don't know the answer to that one. I can. Uh, uh, we can come back and ask you. Or, or Paul might know. Good afternoon, Supervisor Arenas. Yeah. So, Anthem is looking, excuse me, Kaiser is looking to have a direct contract with the state for right. managed care live. So, she, they will have a separate contract relative to that. But they will be responsible for working and coordinating locally with the other health plans. So, we, do you anticipate having the same kind of offer, if you will, of, of cooperation or collaboration that we're, we are establishing with Anthem? We would expect that, yes. And is, are those conversations already beginning, or are we waiting until they are a formal part of the, of the system? Not, not as of yet, but we do expect to do so when we get to that point. Yeah. When, when do you anticipate that happening? Um, well, once we get clarification of when Kaiser and the state come to agreement relative to the direct contract? Yeah, I, it would be great for, for them to also get folded into these efforts rather than have them recreate um, something very separate from our system um, in the same way that, that you've all managed to uh, establish with Anthem, which is just really fabulous. I don't understand the 20% that they get to keep and, um, and uh, our systems are doing all the really uh, difficult work. Um, but I hope that that's something that you can work on as we go into the uh, second phases of this and see if there's an opportunity to negotiate less than 20%. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify that uh, of the 60 million that could be earned, 20% um, of that 60 million is associated with Anthem Medi-Cal beneficiaries. So it's not necessary that ah. they would retain 20% of that $60 million. Uh, got it, but I, I'm asking about what that, usually there's a pass-through fee that is established, and I don't know what that is. Um, right now, we haven't fully negotiated the whole $60 million expenditure plan. We've only um, uh, come to agreement on the, the first $15.5 million. And um, as you see from the report, the MCPs collectively um, are retaining about 1.3 million, some of which is for staff to manage the program and some for some of their administrative costs. Um, if we could have this outlined in, the, in your upcoming second uh, expenditure report um, so that we can understand it. And if there's any additional information um, with with Kaiser and, and that partnership and um, their future role, that would be lovely if we could include that as well. Thank sure. you. Looks like there are no further comments. This would be the final motion on uh, 88. We have a motion by Chavez, a second by Arenas. I see no lights, let's take a vote. All right, Supervisor Arenas. Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Yes. Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion carries, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next order of business is item 89. Um, to, to, to begin this item, I, I just wanna make two brief uh, points. 
As noted earlier, we'll discuss our recommendations for continued improvement to the budget process at the June 27th uh, meeting. During the May workshops, each of us raised uh, some thoughts on the inventory process and various concerns and opportunities for improvement. Today's action is to vote on the slate of proposals submitted, by, submitted for 23-24. Uh, I think a robust discussion of the process is worthwhile, but not today, uh, and look forward to more on that uh, ahead of next year's uh, budget. Today, again, the focus will be just on the recommended items before us. Uh, second, uh, and with a nod to my colleague, two over to my light left, with respect to the inventory items and the Levine Act process, I have reviewed my list of contributors since January 1st, 2023, and I have not found that any of them ne necessitate my return of contributions because of the need to vote on an inventory item. However, since the proposed FPPC regulations are still evolving, I of course reserve the right to return any contributions in whole or in part that may later become an issue as a result of my vote on these inventory items as my, my, my goal in all cases will be not to recuse myself but to not, not accept or return uh, contributions that, that could be problematic. So with that, I think I come back to Colin for a Levine Act statement and then to uh, Supervisor Smidian. Sure. Item 89B is subject to the Levine Act. Any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member as described on page three of the agenda. Participants who have a financial interest and their agents are requested to make a similar disclosure. Supervisor Sabidian. Thank you, and as uh, just discussed, we've been advised that items on today's agenda may be subject to the Levine Act, as indicated in the language on our published agenda. We've also been advised that pursuant to state law, any party or their agents must disclose on the record a contribution of more than $250 made to a board member, as described on page three of our agenda. So I want to ask at this time that if any party or agent has made such a contribution, that they disclose that contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. I would also ask that if any participant in these proceedings, as defined by the Levine Act, has made such a contribution, that they disclose the contribution immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And I would also ask that if any employee of the county council's office or the clerk of the board's office or any other member of county staff or any member of the public knows of any reason I should recuse myself under the Levine Act, that they please disclose that information immediately so that I may promptly recuse myself. And finally, Madam President, while it is, of course, a matter of public record, I would like to note that since January 1, 2023, when Senate Bill 1439 took effect and amended the Levine Act, I have, in fact, received various campaign contributions, which have, of course, been reported in full as required by law. All such reports are public, and I would ask that if anyone has any reason to believe that any of those contributions were unlawfully made, that they advise me of that immediately so that I may correct the situation and ensure that the contributions that are not permitted are not subsequently given or received. And finally, let me just exhort any and all potential campaign contributors, please, please make no contribution which violates Senate Bill 1439, the Levine Act, or any other provision of the law. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Do we have speakers uh, on item 89? Yes, we currently have 12 speakers uh, in the room, along with five online currently, or six currently. Excellent, thank you. To the um, folks in the room, if you are intending to speak on this item but have not yet submitted a yellow card, now is the time to do so. Uh, happy to have as many of you as would like to speak, but once the first speaker begins, the queue will close. For speakers on Zoom, uh, you have a few extra moments. Please, if you're intending to speak on item, on item 89, which is the inventory of budget proposals, now is the time to raise your virtual hand. The Zoom queue will close when the first virtual, the first speaker on Zoom begins speaking. Thank you. Will you call the first five speakers? All right. Uh, please, uh, let me call the first five. Carol Lilia, Omar Salazar, Jessica Montezuma, Alma Fajardo, and Teresa Garcia. Please come on down. And you will each have one minute to speak in any order. Thank you. Sorry. Good. 
Good afternoon. My name is Carol Lillig. I'm from St. Vincent de Paul at St. Catharines in Morgan Hill. This is my colleague Brian Malictum from the city of Morgan Hill. We work together um, to help unhoused folks uh, obtain housing. Uh, St. Vincent de Paul is a nonprofit. We just get donations from community members and we um, pay out every dollar to help folks, folks pay bills as needed. Uh, Brian was hired by the city of Morgan Hill a year and a half ago. He does our case management, does the assessment, meets folks where they are at, and gets them the services they need. I do want to add real quick, we've been able to house a little bit over 30 referrals, um, mostly families, some individuals, with St. Vincent de Paul, and that is outside of the county's VI Spadat assessment. And that's just with about $40,000 of community donations. So we're thankful for the opportunity. Um, you know, more funding will allow us to one family, one mm -hmm. household at a time get folks into housing. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Teresa Garcia. I am a family advocate for Somos Mayfair and Painter Elementary School. I urge you to pass section uh, Section 89 to support the Family Resource Center uh, located at Painter School, which provides parenting classes, early learning education, and we provide um, essential services to the families as well. To specifically, more specifically, to Latinos and you know a multi-ethnic uh, family, and our goal is to th to thrive as advocates for our children and for our communities. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica Moctezuma. I am a staff member, early learning specialist at Painter. Um, I urge you to pass section 89 and support the Mayfair Resource uh, Center within Painter. Um, I have personally seen the growth. They come, um, you know, they come in for a resource, they join an early learning program, and then they become actively involved, and then they apply to our organization to work alongside us. You know, they become leaders, they become advocates within our community. So we see the progress and we see the positive outcomes that come out of this. Um, so I urge you to please vote yes on Article 89. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Alma Fajardo. Soy um, colaborador, miembro del personal, miembro de la junta participante del programa en Painter. Los insto a que aprueben el artículo 89 y apoyen los centros de recursos familiares Somos Mayfair en Painter, que brindan clases a padres de familia uh, de aprendizaje y el aprendizaje temprano acceso a servicios y apoyo y el desarrollo de liderazgo para familias multietnicas para que podamos prosperar para ser defensores de nuestros hijos y comunidades. Dichos recursos son necesarios para distribución de pañales, para espacios para nuestras reuniones y clases para padres y también para el servicio de educación temprano para los niños que antes de entrar al kinder, pues es necesario que aprendan también. Gracias. Gracias. We have a translator. Rosario, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Senet Pajardo. I'm a uh, member and I cooperate with the program with, with the program and I uh, I agree that you approve Article 89. This is giving support to families and parents. We um, are giving support through Somos Mayfair. And we also give support through classes to family members and early learning for children. Also, we develop leadership with uh, families of multi-ethnic uh, members. We teach them to prosper and to defend, defend themselves. And also, um, we are able to support children and the community. Um, we also give out diapers we did classes, as I said before, and also we are helping in the early development and teaching, uh, educating family members. Thank you. 
If I could ask the next five speakers to come up to the, the podium. We got Nelene Lopez, Dilza Gonzalez, Victor Vasquez, Veronica Talton, and Brenda Garcia O'Haro. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Nain López y estoy aquí para pedir a ustedes que aprueben el artículo 89, ya que nos ayudaría a nosotros como padres y a los niños a que no se cierre el a lugar de Painter que participamos nosotros y que aprendemos ahí muchas clases y nos ha ayudado a mí como madre y a mi niña como para entrar al kinder, la cual tomó clases de semillas ahí y la cual hemos participado a uh, muchas veces. Entonces, por eso estamos aquí nosotros para pedir que aprueben el artículo 89 y esperemos si podamos ser escuchados esta tarde. Gracias. Rosario, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Nain Lopez and I am in favor of Article 89. And this, um, this would be very helpful for me as a family member and also for children. We don't want you, we, we don't want to this place painter to close because here we have received uh, the opportunity of having so many classes and we have received a lot of help. For example, me as a mother and my uh, daughter uh, receiving some education before kindergarten. And also um, that's why we are, we are here today as parents and we want, we want, to, we want you to approve Article 89. Um, hopefully, our voice is heard today. Thank you very much. Oh, come, come right up to the microphone. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear and honorable supervisors. My name is Ilsa Gonzalez. I'm a community member, but also an organizer within Somos Mayfair. I urge you to pass Section 89 and support the, fa support the Somos Mayfair Family Resource Center in Painter which provides parents like myself early learning education services, access to services, and leadership development so we can advocate for our children and communities. I am a clear example why, why funding Somos Mayfair changes lives. I started as a parent receiving the resources and participating with my kids. Then I, was, I became a coordinator when the position opened, and now I'm a policy manager within Somos. My dream is, and hope is to ensure that more families have the same opportunities I had to thrive in my community not only in Somos, but in their communities and other workspaces. You can be part of Changes Lives like mine and families you heard today by approving Section 89. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Veronica Talton, a performing arts educator and member of the African American Community Service Agency, the only African American cultural center in the Silicon Valley. Today, I implore the Board of Supervisors to consider increasing the funding for the agency in 2023-24. This weekend, we are preparing to honor Juneteenth, which is the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. The journey of African Americans in the U.S. has been characterized by pain, suffering, and injustice. And over 400 years later, blacks are still fighting for change. We are less than 4% of the population in the county and desperately need OXA, the agency, as a light in our community as it continues to provide vital services to our community. In President Biden's Juneteenth proclamation, he shared that, quote, on Juneteenth, we recommit ourselves to the work of equity, equality, and justice, end quote. It is my hope that this board will demonstrate its commitment to the greater community by fully financing the agency. Thank you very much. Dear Honorable Supervisors, my name is Brenda Garcia Lujano. I am a staff member at Ben Painter FRC, and I urge you to pass Section 89. I've been part of SOMOS as a participant, a leader, and staff member, and a community member. 
Our FRCs create alternative systems and give families hope and an opportunity to use their skills and strengths within their home and their community. Our FRCs are an opportunity for families and communities to thrive. The families have access to positive parenting workshops, services, referrals, diapers, and many more distributions. Somos FRCs are an opportunity for families to advocate for their children and community. Please support us to continue making positive changes in our community. Vote yes on Article 89. Uh, good afternoon, Victor Vasquez, co ed at Somos, he's a collective, backbone leader, and also I'm in support of AXA's request. Um, you know, at Somos, there's a lot of intersectionalities, and I appreciate the commitment that this board has done to support early child care uh, and also early child care education. I believe a few months ago, you, you rallied around $20 million. And I mentioned that we're intersectional because a lot of our families that also need those services also need resources, they need education, they need a place to belong. The centers at Somos, and I would say also at AXA, um, are a perfect example of how these spaces are, are places where people of different backgrounds come together and unify, where children have positive development, where fathers explore patriarchy and how to change their lives, where women who are often excluded from jobs, because they can't get back to work if they don't have a job, have a place for them to be employed. These are places where all of our families can succeed and thrive, but most importantly, where the next seven generations are set up for success. Can I please ask Michelle Ortega, Jose Serrano, and anyone else who would like to speak on the item, please step forward. Michelle or Jose? Looks like we need Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Michelle Ortega and I'm an FRC coordinator family advocate for Somos Mayfair at Bain Painter. I urge you to pass section 89 and support the Somos Mayfair Family Research Centers at Bay Painter, which provides positive parenting classes early early learning education services, and leadership development for multi-ethnic families. This will help our community to thrive. I have witnessed how families become involved and grow within our community and then within the organization. It motivates families to become involved and we have positive feedback from workshops, referrals, and other programs. We, we give them the tools to build their strength. Thank you. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es José Serrano y uh, <coughs> yo soy del programa de la Escuela Painter y, y, y este, yo les, este, les invito a que, a que aprueben la, 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 este, el artículo 89 para apoyar al, al Centro de Recursos Familiares, porque yo, este, yo vengo de, ese, de, ese, de, esa, de esos talleres que que yo no sabía, ¿no? Yo, yo, este, yo tengo 56 años y nunca había estado en un taller de esos y, y está, está muy bien, este se enriquece mucho de, de lo que te enseñan ahí los, los compañeros y, y este, a mí me pareció muy bien este cuidado de niños y, y cuidado de, de este, y ahí aprendí muchas cosas que que no sabía antes que, que cuando estaba joven. Gracias. Gracias. Go ahead, Rosario. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Jose Serrano, and I am here as a part of the member of the program. I want you to please approve Article 89. I'm in support of this uh, family center, family resources center. And when I came here, I joined the workshops. I would like to say I'm 56 years old, and I've never been in those workshops before. They are quite uh, okay. They are very enriching, and it's very nice to see how um, they are taking good care of children. And I also need to say I learned so many things now in those workshops than when I was younger. Thank you. We currently have 15 requests to speak online. 
Next up, we have Maria Martinez. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, good afternoon, um, honorable supervisor. My name is Maria Martinez, and I'm staff from Somos Mayfair. And I urge you to pass section 89 uh, to support Somos Mayfair Family Resource Center at Bent Painter Elementary, especially because we have resources as a preschool co-op in this area, and we support many families in the education of the children, especially those families that do not qualify for the suicide preschool or cannot affordable or private preschool. But we also provide economic opportunities for, for families as parents have the opportunity to apply to be a teacher assistant. As, as I'm a co-worker there, I start participating in this program uh, and now I am site supervisor for one of the family resource center. Please support and vote yes in and, and Article 89. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janelle Garcia. You have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Okay. <laughs> My name is Janelle. I am an early learning specialist at the Family Resource Center of Ben Painter. I urge you to pass Article 89 and support Somos Mayfair Family Resource Center and Bay Painter, which provide cl par parenting classes, early learning education services, access to services and supports and leadership development for multi-ethnic families so we can thrive to be advocates for our children and communities. We urge you to please support so that we may continue to provide the families the resources and tools to strengthen their skills to learn and to grow. They all deserve to thrive and shine brightly in this community. Vote yes on Article 89. Thank you. The next speaker is Sonia Solano. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Um, muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Sonia Solano. Soy coordinadora de la escuelita de Somos Mayfair. La cooperativa ha sido fundamental para apoyar a las familias y especialmente a los niños en su aprendizaje. Es la oportunidad de involucrar a los padres, a ser maestros de sus hijos y reforzar su educación y tener éxito escolar. Los insto a que aprueben el artículo 89 y apoyen los centros de recursos familiares Somos Mayfair en Painter, que brindan clases para padres, servicios de educación de aprendizaje temprano, acceso a servicios y apoyos y el desarrollo de liderazgo para las familias multietnicas para que podamos prosperar para ser defensores de nuestros hijos y comunidades. Vote sí en el artículo 89. Gracias. Good afternoon, my name is Sonia Solano. I'm a coordinator for the School of Somos Mayfair. And I am here for, I wanted to support the, the, the resources center. This is giving support to, to families and also children and the early development. They are involving parents and um, try to develop parents as teachers of their own children. Um, also, please, I'm here to support Article 89. Um, please support these resource centers for family. They are giving classes to families that we, they are devoted to early development, early learning, and also um, the leadership development. So please vote yes in Article 89. Thank you. The next speaker is Oscar Quiroz Medrano. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hi, uh, my name is Oscar Quiroz Medrano. I am a coordinator with Somos Mayfair. Um, I actually urge you to, to pass Section 89. We support supported the We Are Bayfair Family Resource Center in Painter, which provides family parenting classes, early learning education services, access to services and supports, and leadership development for multi-ethnic families so we can thrive, be advocates for our children and communities. I wish, this, I wish these programs were available when I was younger. It would have saved me a lot of other obstacles that I had to encounter. Um, please pass a uh, section 89. Thank you. The next speaker is Sharon Luna. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, President Ellenberg and supervisors. My name is Sharon Luna, board member of the 
from our Teen Neighborhood Association, SMNA. We thank Supervisor Arenas and her wonderful team for recognizing what we try to accomplish for our community and others. We urge you to support item, Article 89. This grant will enable us to enhance our numerous community pro programs that you may not be aware of, of that we do. Uh, we have our turkey and Christmas donations to those uh, individuals and families that are in desperate need. We provide our local school with assistance, provide educational programs for our community in our community meetings. Um, our local residential home um, is in desperate need for items um, that we are trying to support. Uh, provide for them. We will be accountable and fiscally responsible to you and the taxpayers. The next speaker, speaker is Camille Villario. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Or good afternoon. My name is Camille Villario and I'm a program manager with Lead Filipino and I'm calling to support Section 89. This funding will help us provide an emotionally and psychologically safe space for youth, students, and families to access the internet and receive support with accessing general resources. We will also be able to coordinate service organizations across the local Filipino community in San Jose and Santa Clara County to provide a continuum of services for youth, students, young adults, families, and seniors in culturally responsive and trauma-informed practices. Lastly, this will strengthen our organization's administrative capacity to coordinate community resources and programs with the partners of the Filipino Americans Coming Together San Jose Coalition, which consists of Lead Filipino, Filipino Youth Coalition, Filipino American National Historical Society of Santa Clara Valley, and the Bayani Angkapataan Filipino School. Thank you. Next speaker is Nayeli Sedano. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, I'm Nayeli Sedana, staff at Summers Mason, manager of the Cesar Chavez Family Resource Center, as well as previously worked at our bank and CFRC supporting our families during the pandemic, including operating a unique preschool co op model. I show up as an advocate along with the voice of our community in every space, and today we are here to urge you to pass Article 89. Bank Painter Family Resource Center, Preschool Co op, and AAPSA are an important part of our family support system, as mentioned provides educational opportunities for parents and caregivers, support children with welcoming spaces that are crucial to a child's development and growth, as well as access to essential services and referrals, building a transforming community. Our research centers support the leadership development of the community to collectively take care of each other and take action for our families as you are seeing today. Um, our community uh, needs this for our future and for our future generations to thrive. Please vote yes on Article 89. The next speaker is Mia Vial. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, good afternoon, honorable supervisors. My name is Mia Vial and I'm from the African American Community Service Agency. And I wanted to speak today regarding the funding matters of AACSA and the African American Cultural Center. The work of AACSA is such an integral part of Santa Clara County and our community in creating and maintaining space for all communities and especially the black community that seek services in the area. In addition, AACSA provides many services for individuals to decrease food deserts with essential food items, dignified to toiletries and free baby care products for families. They help those in need and provide cultural programs that educate the public on matters within the black community and all communities and the political landscape locally and nationally. Thank you. The next speaker is Jessica Trejo. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Trejo, and I am a family advocate with Somos Mayfair, but I am also a mother at Alum Rock Union School District, and I support Article 89 because there is a high need for early learning opportunities here in our county, um, and our Ben Painter Family Resource Center provides that and more through our preschool co-op and parent workshops, like leadership development that parents and caregivers experience when they gain insight and knowledge on how to best support their children and children in our community. The Family Resource Center is a space is, is a safe space where families of different ethnic backgrounds and cultures come together and share their experiences and challenges in parenting and each provides uh, support and share resources that help our children thrive our children are our future leaders and i urge you to please pass article 89. our next speaker is marisol ponce you'll have one minute to speak the timer will start when you begin speaking
And Marisol? Sorry about that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Marisol Ponce with Rebecca Children Services. Rebecca Children Services offers a full continuum of family-centered mental health care and educational services to promote the healthy development of children and families. We respectfully request funding from the art from the Article 89 grant. These funds, if awarded, will be used to purchase play therapy toys and supplies for our treatment rooms. These therapeutic supplies will be used by children and youth in our District 1 communities who desperately need mental health support. The need for mental health and behavioral health services has exponentially increased, especially, especially since the beginning of the pandemic. By offering play therapy tools to South County children, they can heal and achieve optimal growth and development. Thank you. Our next speaker is Claudia Coelho. You'll have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. My name is Claudia Coelho. I have been participating in programs at Painter for many years now, where not only my special needs son has highly benefited, but so have I as a parent, community leader, and organizer, which is why I'm here in support of Somos Mayfair Resource Center in Painter. They provide leadership development for families who take on the highly valued role of advocates for children in our community, along with early learning education and parenting classes. Please vote yes on Article 89. Thank you. Our next speaker is Arturo Munoz. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, good afternoon, our um, county board members. I'm Arturo Munoz, community organizer of Mayfair. Mayfair. I miss calling to support um, the approval of Article 89 as it continues to serve as a very vital resource for our communities. Not only was it really crucial for our community during the pandemic, they were really, that, that trust was created from years and years of serving our communities in our, in the, it's the Advent Painter. And for us to continue having resources such as FRC, the Family Resource Center Advent Painter, it continues to amplify the, the community not only continues to need this services, but we as a uh, family resource centers could provide those services that would really support um, the parents, the children, and all the community members within the surrounding neighborhoods. So continue to um, support the work that we're doing and um, vote yes on Article 89. Thank you for your time. The next speaker is Melena Aguinaldo. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, my name is Malena Aguinaldo and I'm a Community Health Initiative intern for Lead Filipino and I'm calling to support Section 89, especially inventory items 55 and 180. The funding will strengthen our organization's capacity to coordinate community resources and programs with our partners in Filipino Americans Coming Together Coalition and create pop -up, a pop-up computer lab to provide technical support for our community. It will also help us to continue our work engaging hundreds of students, young adults, and families in critical consciousness building, personal development, and understanding Asian American Pacific Islander experiences. Thank you. The next speaker is Denari Cervantes. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, my name is Daenerys Cervantes. I am a early learning specialist of Somos Mayfair at Ben Painter. I urge you to pass section 89. Passing this section will continue to support the family resource centers by providing parenting classes, early learning education services, leadership development and access to services and support families and so families can thrive to be able to advocate for their children and their community. I personally have seen these families thrive and I wish to continue to see more families thrive. Vote yes to Article 89. Thank you. Our final speaker is Ann Hartman. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Ann Hartman with the YMCA of Silicon Valley, and I'm here in support of Supervisor Chavez's inventory item, providing funding to enable underserved youth in East San Jose access to YMCA summer enrichment and school break camps. Uh, we'd like to thank Supervisor Chavez for putting this item forward and the Board of Supervisors for your consideration and urge you to pass item 89. The Y serves some of our most vulnerable youth in East San Jose. Uh, when school is out, youth with the greatest need, need lose access to essential support provided while school is in and face challenges related to learning hunger, access to enrichment and safe space to spend the day while parents work and parents struggle to find affordable high quality care. 
Camp not only provides a fun enriching environment, but it helps bridge the gap and support for those basic needs, providing educational activities, daily healthy food and physical activity, and a safe space to spend the day while their parents are working. Y Camp is a place where youth learn new skills, receive social emotional learning and support, build confidence. And that concludes our request to speak. Thank you very mo much. I'll look to my colleagues for a motion on item 89. I'll move approval of 89. Thank you. Is there a motion by Chavez, second by Arenas? And I just wanted to make one um, comment as it relates to item 89. And, and this was um, an item I raised colleagues, it feels like 100 years ago, but it was probably just two days ago, around making sure that for our service providers, we were looking at multi-year contracts for them. And one of them that I raised that I, I think the staff has a solution which will come back to us in the fall was around the community health partnership and the folks helping us with redetermination. I also just wanted to acknowledge we're in a similar situation with the Healthier Kids Foundation and I'd like to encourage the staff to bring both of those items to, back to the board for discussion um, at the same time in the future. Whenever I think that's September, August or September. Looking for some nods or eye contact from this side. <laughs> Okay. Got Thank it. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank Any you. additional uh, supervisor leads? Then Supervisor Simidian. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I actually do have a question for staff regarding the issue that was mentioned by uh, Supervisor Chavez. It's more of an understanding of the inventory process. And just like uh, Supervisor Arenas, I'm fairly new. Uh, in terms of these inventory process, my understanding has always been an allocation for the year. But then uh, there's also some proposals this year for covering multi-year project. I just want to see what is the history of how this process is being used to fund multi-year projects. If you could share that for us. Yes, um, historically we've um, tried to um, make sure that the board makes requests that are one-year projects because uh, multi-year projects are changes in the function of the entire organization and the budget and uh, they're not they're more appropriate as referrals because at least they get discussed um, but of course three votes on the board can do anything they want um, so you know we would encourage it to be one year uh, and have anything that's an ongoing expenditure be discussed as a referral. Um, that's about all I have to say. <laughs> Super, anything else? Sure. So I just also want to mention um, and highlight that, uh, uh, first of all, I really want to thank uh, President Ellenberg for putting onto future agenda the improvements to the inventory budget process for the, was it the June 27th meeting? Um, and I want to highlight that after all of the inventory proposals that were reviewed and sunshined a few weeks ago, our office reviewed all the organizations that were recommended for funding from multiple offices, and we voluntarily pulled back a few proposals I had submitted for funding because they were duplicative or covering the same proposed projects. Um, as we consider improvements of the budget process, I really do hope that we could take a closer look at the budget inventory process, improve the communications of outreach, transparency, and accountability, as previously suggested by President Ellenberg. Thank you. Yeah, to, to be clear, the, um, we're coming forward with a, a discussion about general budget process improvements, mm -hmm. um, but earlier, the, this board appointed myself and Supervisor Arenas in, through an ad hoc committee to look specifically at the inventory process and then come to this body with recommendations. And I can assure you that we will not have that ready by June 27th. Understood. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can count on that. <laughs> Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, uh, Madam President, and I can either offer this up as a friendly amendment or make it as a standalone motion. Um, I do think, since we are taking action on uh, these inventory items today, uh, that it is appropriate to 
uh, as I've given this some thought, I thought we might ask the Harvey Rose organization to simply do a sort of representative random audit on these items uh, at some point in the future and uh, then in that way ensure that um, while we wouldn't have the bandwidth to audit the performance to the extent that there are performance requirements built in, um, we would at least have a way of communicating to every recipient that there was the potential for an audit and that that was uh, essentially a condition of receipt. So I will offer that as a friendly amendment and if it's not acceptable as a friendly amendment, then I would offer it as a standalone motion. That's acceptable. That's a great thank idea. You. Thank you. And I think you made the second. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, that's, thank you. We all good? Thank you very much. We have a motion, Super, uh, Dr. Smith. I just thought maybe I should expand on the issue of multiple year contracts. Um, you know, when we do inventory items, um, we don't have deliverables in the um, grant. And so another reason why multi-year contracts are preferable as referrals rather than um, inventory items is so that we can develop a performance expectations. Thank you. I'm going to hold further um, comment on this until we are prepared for, for a full discussion on the item, but I would like to, Supervisor Arenas. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank everybody who's um, uh, come to uh, speak about their own specific program um, or a participant or as a participant, uh, share your experience with us. It has been really meaningful um, here in, in the chambers as well as online to hear all those different experiences. And while some of those programs may not be in my specific district, I, I truly appreciate the work that's being done throughout our county um, because when our children and families are healthy anywhere, they're, um, it just speaks volumes about um, the job that that we're doing as a county and, and the value that we place on families. And so it just, it really um, inspires me to hear so many really uh, wonderful testimonies. So I just wanted to thank uh, the folks uh, for calling in. Um, and then uh, just uh, for, for you colleagues, uh, a special thank you. I hope that, you know, we, we have this as a unanimous vote. I know that I've asked for a bit more than what was, um, uh, uh, suggested as as a stop, um, and and I, I've got to tell you, I'd love to follow rules, um, except that um, when there's a need, um, and based on the principle of equity, I know my county, my part of the county has um, been absolutely um, uh, overlooked uh, throughout the years, and um, uh, and hasn't had a proper um, inventory item opportunity um, and so this is the first year and I, I've got to tell you that they've been so grateful and so I just wanted to convey that all to you how grateful um, that a lot of our agencies who've stepped up and have said you know we need some additional funding but we'll take on and we'll take on this task um, have expressed how grateful they are uh, that they got this opportunity this year and so anyways uh, thank uh, thank you I thank all of you and I look forward to that um, ad hoc uh, committee um, beyond uh, beyond June so that we can <laughs> uh, come back next year and have a, a new fresh take uh, um, on our inventory items um, so thank you thank you all for your thoughtful comments Colin let's vote Supervisor Arenas Yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Seminian. Aye. Vice President Lee. Aye. President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item 90 is to consider proposed modifications to the county executive's fiscal year 2023-2024 recommended budget to produce the fiscal year 2023-2024 final budget. It has all come down to this. Let's, um, <laughs> uh, let's again begin with public comment on this item. Please, do we have speakers in the chambers or on Zoom? 
There are no speakers in chambers, and there are no requests to speak online. And I will return to um, my colleagues. We are going to hopefully handle 90A through F in a, in a single motion, if someone is interested in making that motion. Madam yes. Chair. Oh, hold on. Um, in B, um, dash A and B, which is a little confusing, that's the difference between the two ordinances having to do with item 17 in the right. Harvey Rose issue. You should choose A1 ordinance, which is what the board suggested. So thank you. Um, we, we did have a, a separate motion on that in the earlier item, which was by Supervisor Lee. And the ultimate recommendation was for, why don't you read your motion again? And, and maybe just make the same motion again here? No? Uh, James? No, just uh, make a motion to accept all of uh, 90 with the decision to use okay. A1 okay. So salary ordinance. Exactly. Perfect. Would you like to do that, Supervisor Lee? Exactly. You spoke what I was coming out of my mouth, uh, Jeff. Thank you. So basically, make a motion to approve all item uh, 90A through F and on the issue of the salary ordinance on A1. Thank you. Thank second. you very much. Um, motion by Lee, second by Chavez. Uh, Supervisor Lee, did you have any other comments? Yes. All right. Sure, I just try to keep it very brief. And, and uh, first of all, I just want to thank staff for a very comprehensive uh, report. Uh, doing a $11.5 billion budget is never easy, Greg. Uh, you did it again, thank you. Uh, and this will be also the last budget as mentioned by President Ellenberg of our wonderful uh, County Executive, uh, uh, Dr. Jeff Smith. And I really want to appreciate all the time and effort you've put in to try to uh, make this a balanced budget and it's never an easy thing. Uh, as a county, we are absolutely by law required to balance our budget uh, and it's not easy uh, to be able to say in the tough <clears throat> budgetary constraint period to be able to pass a budget with no layoffs. And in this case, this is a budget that even though we are voting to get some positions, uh, but these are vacant positions, in the way it's kind of like a cut on paper or paper cut. <laughs> uh, but no, <laughs> we're told by the administration that these positions being deleted would not be hired in the upcoming year, even if they were not deleted. And that's why we're voting this way. And because they're also, the fact that there are hundreds of other vacancies that still needs to be filled first. And so I just want to make sure and reiterate that the other vacancies, if they were filled, if we're so fortunate that we could get those filled, that we are truly running our vacancies to fill and then their need is still there, as we are seeing today, for staff to come back to the support ASAP to make sure that we could reinstate some of these vacancies to make sure the right people will be able to put in those positions, number one. Second thing is we spend a lot of time talking about the so-called item number 17 uh, of the positions being put into our VMC uh, and our healthcare system because of the very fact that A, we have a huge need, and two is many of those positions practically are paid for and put potentially even be revenue positive. So I think these are the type of decisions this board is making very wisely uh, for the long term. Obviously, there is still um, some type of structural um, uh, concern uh, of our, our potential deficit given the fact that this is going to be a tough year from the state. And we don't know, we have no crystal ball, right, Greg? You wish you have one, but we don't have one yet. Uh, until that's been invented, we are doing the best we can right here. So I just want to thank the staff uh, and my colleague for this and hope we could get a unanimous Thank you. Supervisor Arenas. Um, I, I also wanted to chime in. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Smith, on this last budget. Um, a really wonderful experience as a first timer. Um, so thank you for, for making it very smooth and for the administration, all of the really wonderful work. Greg, I'm looking at you. I know that you've, you've headed a, a lot of this uh, this workload. But there's a lot of folks who support you and have done a lot of the details and the nuances um, to make it all easy for us. So um, congratulations to you and your team, as well as uh, James and, and uh, Greta and Kavita. Everybody who's, who's here plays a part um, to making this uh, a successful uh, end of the year budget. Um, 
And then lastly, just happy birthday. <laughs> I really hope that you just party up this uh, Father's Day weekend. And so happy Father's Day. Well, thank and, you. Um, and happy birthday. We'll try. Thanks. Um, can I make a comment after Supervisor uh, Chavez gets done? Absolutely. Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. I, I wanted to say thank you to my colleagues to, for paying such, a, such close attention to the county that we all love. And I, in particular, wanted to say a very, very sincere thank you to the staff. The off-agenda reports were really very thorough, and the budget every year gets more and more um, clear, and all of that is really appreciated. It's so important for the public, and um, so I want to say thank you, and especially I see everybody still working on their computers back there, <laughs> tapping away, probably getting ready for one other or two loose ends, um, but just a very sincere thank you, and please share that with your colleagues. And I wanted to say to Dr. Smith, um, not only happy birthday, but happy last budget. <laughs> and um, there's no song that goes with that, lucky you. Um, <laughs> little salsa dancing on the side. But I, but I really did want to say um, thank you that you must be looking at this budget with a lot of pride over the number of years to see the investments that you've led on and really helped people in the county live a better, healthier, um, safer lives. So congratulations to you. Thank you. I did want uh, can to. Can I do mind if I? Oh, you go ahead and have, go oh, first. Greta had her light on. It's okay, Jeff. You can go first. <laughs> well, I I wanted to thank all of the budget staff, the OBA staff, and Greg and um, James and Greta for all the effort and time they put into preparing this budget. It's always a challenge to make sure that the budget balances, but more of a challenge to make sure that it reflects the priorities and uh, values of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I hope we did that appropriately. I want to thank the Board for asking great questions and holding us accountable and um, finally approving the budget. I just want to point out that um, just a an interesting fact, um, even though we are by population the sixth largest county in California, we are by budget the second largest. And LA has about a $30 billion budget. Ours obviously, you just are going to approve hopefully in a little bit, 11.2. Um, everybody else is considerably below that. So I think that indicates how this board and many boards for many years have been really committed to providing services of the utmost quality and priority to our community. And that's really something you should be very proud of. Um, and thanks to all of our employees for doing a great job so that we actually have the privilege of passing a budget that actually improves people's lives. So thank you. Well, Jeff, I just wanted to say one thing, which is I'm so glad that your last budget also got to be my first budget as chief operating officer and that we got to work on this together. And also wanted to thank Greg and the entire OBA team who worked really tirelessly through what was actually a very challenging budget where a lot of changes needed to be made at the last minute based on a more complicated and difficult budget picture. And also to all the departments who did step up to really scramble to, to make some of the changes that we had to make to make this budget balance. And I think this was actually um, quite a smooth process given the immense challenges that we faced and the timeline on which we faced them. So just wanted to thank the board, but most of all, thank you, Jeff, for getting to um, be around long enough to do this budget with me and with the entire team. And we're gonna really miss having your voice in all these conversations next year. Let's vote. Supervisor Arenas. <laughs> yes. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Vice President Lee. Aye. And President Ellenberg. Yes. Motion carries, thank you. We have a budget. Thank you to everyone. <laughs> Item 91 is to adjourn, so let's do that.